Hey, pronouncers, welcome back to another episode. We are dropping new episodes now every Thursday. Really exciting because we got producer Chris on board and he is just cranking. He is cranking. Um, we've got Stephen Farrig, Matt Marcott. We are hanging out. Uh, first, really quick announcement. When this comes out, it should be out as well. Print Hustlers Conf 2021 is going to be October 22 Ooh. and 23. So super, super. Yeah, super, super excited about that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but that's going to be really exciting. Hey, um, it's going to be two days, but we're, we're partnering with some really cool people. So this is not just Printavos anymore. We are partnering with Brett Bowden um, uh, over at Made Labs with Tom Davenport, too. And so that's very exciting. And Bella Canvas is a big, big sponsor this year. Um, so they're going to make it happen, too. So we're pumped. Steven's already booked his tickets. His hotels are booked, and he's in Chicago. Staycation. <laughs> oh, boy. But, yeah, that's all good. Steven, how's Campus Inc. been going, though? Campus Inc. is good. It is summer. Summer means hit the reset button. Every summer we reset the company. Um, so we've brought eight interns from across the country here working with our team, hiring a bunch of new employees. We got eight weeks until school is back. So we, uh, we are in full steam to revamp just about everything. We really rebuild everything from top to bottom. What, is so, the, what are the interns? Is that sales interns or? Everything. We, have, we split them up into departments. Their leads will work with them. Um, it could be from marketing to sales to prospecting to you know, content. Um, to TikToks, you name it. Um, and then our production team in, in, in Urbana will be working on resetting as well. That might mean a new floor plan, um, just working on everything. We basically have you know eight weeks of, of a chill time. We take advantage of it so that when school's back, we're back and we're stronger and better. So that's so unique that you're, like. you're kind of flip-flop from like the rest of the industry, right? I don't love it. Right now it's like eight weeks of like, let's get ready to not be able to breathe for most shops. That's, that's when like the ramp up happens. So it's super unique that you've got kind of summer to reset, re replan, revamp. I mean, it's, it's hard work, but it's, it's such an interesting switch from most people and what they experience. In I, summer I don't love it because you're, it's a very tight summer. Right, you have to watch your cash flow, everything, and our town really shuts down over the summer. So, like, we're able to get some pretty big POs, but not the type of volume we're getting in October and April. But what are you going to do? Like, that's our niche, so that's how we have to attack it. We say we have to crush it eight months of the year. So, but you guys yeah. stay busy in like January, February, and March, where most shops are that that's their dead time. So, I mean, you're kind of like flip-flopping when you have that hard time to, to get a little tighter with finances, but just a little different time of the year. Yeah, so we got a auto auto bagger folder. Ooh. Wally and Matt helped us with that, which is great. Fixed up and ready took to a run. Little, a little rebuilding, right? It took a little rebuilding, but we're working this summer. It's all about print on demand. How are we going to figure out print on demand? Because uh, the way Shopify is working and e-commerce and merch – We've got to get product out faster, and uh, waiting two weeks after a store closes is too slow now. So we are going to try and tackle uh, print on demand. Is that a print, in, a print in stock, or are you talking like, you know, more fulfillment every week, or I guess it depends on the customer? I'll, I'll let you know in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Once he figures it out. All right, we'll let's, get let, let's Steven do the, do the Steven thing and like solve all of its problems and then he'll just show us how to do it. I, it'll be interesting. Uh, but what's really cool is line item groups is dropping. Got the beta going for that. So we're revamping all of our pricing, which is dope. So just lots of stuff. Always hiring new employees over the summer. I feel like the bigger the business gets, the more I'm just like a recruiter and hiring and interviewing. Oh my gosh. Um, you know that. That sounds Bruce, familiar, huh, Bruce? Oof. Bruce, you guys just hired a recruiter to do that now. Yeah, it's hard. I, to be honest, I don't want to say that I was burnt out, but I think that it's hard to do it at scale forever. It, it, and it's like the problem doesn't get any easier. It's not like you just bring on this one person and you're done. As much as like you think about it, you're like, yes, I closed them. It's a huge sale for me. Like These are my sales, right? This is 
okay, we brought that person on. Then in a month, it's like, oh, we need somebody else to help with that. And it's like, got to go back out to the talent pool, you know, and, and screen and phone screen and do all that thing. And then, of course, now it feels like everybody's hiring and everybody's having trouble hiring. And so, um, yeah, our full-time recruiter, Mary, she started last week uh, or almost two weeks ago. And her role is just to outreach for mainly engineering talent. Um, as that's our biggest bottleneck and just source outreach phone screen to get them in. I mean, I feel like we have to talk to maybe 40 people or something to phone screen 50 people before we find somebody that's good, which means you have to send X amount of emails to even get that phone screen. So, um, and then I'm hoping that she'll also be able to help start training and get them ramped up too, which is another big, well, and screen. after the phone screen, it's still two to three interviews after that, isn't it? Yeah, we have the phone screen and then we have the final uh, interview. Normally, it's like two phone screens, one with her, one with the hiring manager, and then one um, final interview with the team. And that could be an hour or two. Uh, and uh, yeah, and they just go through projects. So how's the hiring been on your end? My end? Yeah. Uh, hard. Um, we're learning that we have to like poach. Um, and be scavengers and find people working for companies that we aspire to be to. And then what, what kind of know, roles, sales roles, sales roles, account executive, account manager roles. So managing really key accounts, you know, if we've built up, Adam's done a great job building up a, a client that does, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And if he's servicing it all the time and trying to help me run the company, that's not sustainable. So how do you find someone as talented, um, as Adam, that's going to be able to service the customer give them everything I want and, and more importantly, make sure like they're, we're doing what we've, what we said we're going to do. Um, and so that's been a challenge, um, because you know, everyone, everyone that is really good right now, I think is employed pretty well. Um, and so you have to be a little bit careful. And so, um, I'm, I'm tapping into the professional market in Chicago and, trying to poach a little bit from um, other companies, you know, account executives at Yelp and Groupon and things like that, that have a ton of real good experience. So it's starting to work for us, but it's definitely a different type of recruiting. Yeah, it's for sure a slog. I mean, and you can't, it's like a sales pipeline. Like you can't just start it up and expect to have results really quickly. You know, you have to build it, warm it up, keep going. And then when you stop it, everything starts cooling off and then you have to start it back again. And you got to teach them the basics of the t-shirt business, right? I mean, they might have the sales side down, understand how to like follow up and how to organize the the, the sales pipeline, but they got to learn the new constraint elements that go into play when it comes to t-shirt business, right? You can't have them over there over promising under delivering. So it's a whole different market, but I think that that makes more sense since they're like trying to poach as t-shirt people, trying to find somebody who's just really good at sales, organization, pipeline, all that stuff. And then you can you can teach them the basics of, of screen printing and get them ramped up pretty quick, hopefully. Wait, Steven, you've actually revamped, I feel like, your onboarding for training for new hires a lot. What, what are you using now? Um, so <clears throat> we use uh, Mighty Network for all of our training. Um, that's where like all the education lives for the company. So every new hire has to go through all the training that our students do first before they go through like continuing education. Um, And every employee has like a different map or or outline of what they're going to be learning. And so it might be, hey, you need to, you're going to take these classes for Udemy um, and it's going to teach you how to use these different tools. I think what I'm learning is other companies, you know, when you get hired at, at some companies, their training process is, you know, two to three months in a classroom. And in our industry, it's uh, a day and here Two you go. Two to three hours. <laughs> Two to three hours and here you go. And it's like, you think about it, um, my cousin got hired at Salesforce and she went through six months of training before wow. she was able to really talk to a client by herself, you know, and has to pass classes and, you know, that's the standard, right? That's the standard. And so even even Starbucks or McDonald's, um, it's it's a long time before they're even allowed to be on their own. And so we realize that uh, if you start them off really well, and even if you overdo training at the beginning, it will pay dividends on the backside um, and it'll make them self-sufficient and stuff like that. So um, trying to double down on that. We use a lot of Loom videos. Loom is my like new best friend. <laughs> Only speak in Loom. 
Um, but it's hard, you know, it's hard. Um, I mean, Matt, you saw it in the industry, right? Like how long did a printer get real like training before they were left alone? Hours. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if most shops, honestly, it's, it's, you, you bring them in, you might have like a, a polar, but they're stuck as a polar. And if you don't have a, a training process, they're never going to go anywhere. Um, so doing things like little like passports to success type things, I, I would always implement where it's like, all right, so many hours doing this, so many hours doing that. And once you start filling hours, then you can like kind of be promoted to even try a new position. So you've caught, you've pulled, you've done receiving, you've done shipping, you've got X amount of hours booked. All right, now I can actually have someone teach you how to register a job, teach you how to, how to load a shirt. And we kind of like keep an eye on that. But Matt, you should sell a passport, like a print passport. <laughs> could, I could put something together. Put a print okay. passport together and like how you master printing and like how many hours and each print printer, I'd buy them from you. Like everyone gets one when you start and you fill out your log, like a flight log. All right, Bruce, earmuffs. We got to talk about a business idea. I don't want to. I can't for Java. I can't for Java taking it. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. We're going to put somebody on there right now. Um, we've, we've got a really exciting episode for you guys today about content marketing, specifically on the SEO side, which is, I feel like, table stakes for people to grab new sales and, and just have their websites optimized. We're going to jump into that in a second. Real quick, though, we've got a brand new section called Ask Anything where you guys can email us podcast at printavo.com and get help with any topic. Um, today, we have got a question from uh, a shop in Birmingham, Alabama, Authentic City Print, LLC. His name's Antoine, um, and he really wants to grow his business, but he's stuck with growing clientele and pricing correctly. I know this is a can of worms, but... Um, those are two different things, growing client clientele and pricing. Let's just start real quick, two minutes on helping a small shop with pricing. Oof. I mean, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first one to bite on that one. So a small shop to do pricing is a, is a hard one when it also depends how long you've been in business, right? In a, in a perfect world, you can take a previous year's capture and take a look at what your throughput was so how many how many garments you decorated against your ent entire overhead and you can start to figure out how much it actually costs you to decorate a good and then you can figure out what kind of margin on top of that you want to want to have for what kind of growth strategy you're looking for right um, last year's data kind of garbage right 2020 was a crapshoot unfortunately for almost every shop out there so you can't really use a capture from 2020 to 2019 but if you're a newer shop that started in 2019 you don't even have a full year so um, the one thing that I really hate for people to do, but it kind of ends up being what most people do, right, is kind of go take a, find the, 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 the median of all the shops around you and kind of start at that spot. Now, that's dangerous because you don't know their overhead, you don't know any of that, any of that data, but if you got nowhere else to start, you can kind of start there, just make sure that you are checking it monthly, quarterly, and that you're not putting out like a, a full year price list. If you're going to put a price out, first of all, if you're going to put it out to the public, make sure it's it's notated like spring 2021. That way, if you have to change it, you've got till summer to change it. And people aren't going to be like, oh, I got a 21 price list right here. Uh, I would say if you're starting off, maybe try to even avoid putting out a public price list and kind of just work with it and analyze weekly, monthly, what your overhead versus what your actually uh, your revenue looks like. Um, we also have an awesome... Uh, spreadsheet that we put together here, Luke uh, put it together, that can kind of help you figure out all your overhead costs against what it actually should be for your charges, um, for different amounts of colors, different shirts, all that. So I would say start there and then just slowly kind of work up toward it. And remember, it's going to be a moving target. You're going to have to go, oop, crap, we didn't make enough money. We gotta raise our prices and start going up. If you look at big business, right? I spent six years selling uh, screen printing equipment. The manufacturer who I sold, they would usually do two price increases a year, anywhere from three to 5%. So anywhere from six to 10% increased yearly, right? And that didn't stop, it kept going. So inflation happens, the world continues to charge more, you can as well. If you haven't upped your prices in a while, it's time to do it, especially on the backside of COVID, we've all gotta kind of make up for, for a dead year. 
So it's not necessarily the perfect answer, but it's a working progress that you have to start putting eyes on and just start analyzing and growing as you go. Steven, thoughts? This is like a Mayweather Pacquiao, like, all right, from my corner, uh, um, well, if you want to grow your business, you can either make more money on what you're currently selling or you can sell more product. That's the, the fundamentals of business. You can sell more or you can make more money on what you're already selling. Contract shops have decided to print more and make less. If you're a new shop, do not do that, period. Do not do that. I repeat, do not start contract printing because you will start spinning your wheels and it can spiral out of control. Ask any of the massive shops, they'll tell you the same exact thing. So that being said, you need to charge accordingly for what you've got. And I go back to it and say, I don't know how much a price of lumber is right now. I know it's really expensive. I know it's six, seven, eight dollars for a two by four. But when I walk into Home Depot, I'm confident. I know it's going to be expensive, but this is what I'm going to pay. And I'm going to walk out with it and do whatever I want. So with that being said, I don't really publish my prices because I think every experience is a relationship and it's a unique opportunity to create a bond where you, you actually eliminate price mattering whatsoever. Um, no differently than a haircut as a custom experience in a small local business. I will give my barber whatever he charges because I like him and I'm going to him because he is my guy. So I think if you're small, you actually need to spend a lot of your time on the relationships and the bonds because people will actually support you. And in this time post-COVID, supporting local business is a no-brainer. And it's very, very easy to sell and say, hey, I know I'm a buck higher than you know this website, but you're supporting me. You're supporting our local economy. That being said, pricing is really hard. Something that we have at Campus Inc. is what's called our daily burn. We know how much money our business costs to run without printing a single shirt. So a book that you probably should read pretty quickly is Profit First, where you learn about what's called real revenue, and you actually take your cost of goods sold um, out of your revenue so you know what your business is actually bringing to you as a service, not a reseller of goods. Right, And so you know, I'm buying a $2 shirt, I'm selling it for 10 bucks, I'm bringing $8 into the game, and how does that affect what it costs to keep my lights on every day, what it, keep, what it costs to keep my business open. Um, some business have a really big daily burn. Um, you know, mine is anywhere between six and $10,000 per day, and that's if we don't print a single shirt. Right. And so some days I realize, oh, man, we printed a bunch of stuff, but we did not even break out of our daily burn. So we're going to need to either print faster or print more or we're going to have to adjust our prices. And it's mostly adjusting prices was what I've learned. We're not charging enough. So there's my two cents. There you go, Bruce. Heck, yeah. All right. We're going to send it over to him. The other one he quickly talked about one minute growing clientele. Um any, I, I mean, you know, Matt, you've got the uh, shop on the side. Steven, probably more when you got started in Campus Inc. Was there any things that uh, helped just jumpstart it that, you could, that he could start doing and, and create a, a, as a part of what he does every day? Yeah, I think uh, it goes back to this. If you reached out to five clients a week or ten clients a week, and even if they're your current clients, just to say hello, that will grow your business. You know, Boom. reach out to 10 clients a week that are your current clients, that will grow your business. And if you do that, reach out to 10 clients that you don't have, say hello, and that will grow your business too. That's it. 100%. I'd also recommend everybody go listen to last week's Printology University with Amy from Threadbare talking about community building. Um, some great insights on how to actually kind of build up within your community, which also helps that bottom line, right? You start reaching out to your community, doing more for it. It, in turn, comes back to do more for you as well. Um, so what Steven said, and then kind of become be, become a, a staple to your community. Don't be afraid to, to be more than just a print shop in that. You are you are the face of that 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 neighborhood or that town or that city as well. And don't be afraid to own that. That's dope. Last thing too is uh, I, I keep remembering quote and hope from our podcast with Kevin Baumgart on sales of, he says so many people just quote and hope they just shoot it out and forget about it. Move on. Don't forget to follow up. You're busy. Your customers are busy. Everybody's just busy. You're not bugging anybody. 
um, it just has to be the right timing for, for, for both parties and you have to catch them. And so the way to do it is keep reminding them. Okay. We've got an awesome episode. If you guys have any questions too, um, feel free f- to join the Ask Anything segment by emailing us podcast at printavo.com. There's so many links down below of, of everything that Stephen and Matt just mentioned. Really, really great episode on content marketing. We're going to jump on in. And don't forget, every Thursday, brand new episode. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Really excited. We've got some very special guests, but more importantly, they are outside the industry, which I like a little bit more sometimes to create just a bit of a balance, but they help us out too. And that's why I wanted to bring them up. Okay. We've got Nate Turner and Kevin King, co-founders of 10 Speed. You guys can check them out, Um, but we've also got our co-host Stephen Farrig on from Campus Inc. joining us too today. Okay, so just as a quick background, 10Speed helps us a lot out with content marketing. As you know, we do a ton of that out there. Um, But specifically on the SEO piece, I'm going to let you guys give the the rest of the background about just what 10Speed is real quick and and how you guys help other companies. Yeah, so 10Speed, we are a content optimization agency. We work with companies to help kind of fuel their full funnel organic growth uh, with by creating and optimizing content. So we're, um, you know, working with blog content, typically um, figuring out the strategy, um, fixing content you already have, as well as helping guide what you should create. And then doing that in sort of a holistic view of is your site sort of set up correctly, the technical aspects of it, and then also where are the you know CTAs? How are you you know setting it up to actually convert the traffic you're getting and actually turn that into real you know real business and real opportunities? That's awesome. So just to backtrack a little bit, in our industry, um, everyone's always talking, "What can I do to get more business?" And we constantly are saying, you know, make sure you have a solid website, make sure it's up to date. How many businesses do you see that you you start working with that don't even have the basics set up? Yeah, um, I would say a fair amount. Um, I think some of the the opportunities we get are some companies that are a little bit more established, so they kind of have that, but um, certainly uh, come across a fair share of folks that just, you know, don't even have a blog set up yet, or um, the site is pretty pretty bare bones and um, sort of a a 2.0 or 3.0 in the works, but um, yeah, I would say it, it's fairly common. Um, and it's just something that, you know, it even can kind of happen to us sometimes where it's just sort of the falls down your to-do list of, of things you're trying to, to run for the business. And, um, it can be easy to sort of let that slip from, you know, weeks into months into years and really having, uh, not having that fully, fully set up and, and working the way it could be. Gotcha. So this is really interesting because when I started with Printavo, Bruce, it was all about the blog. Keep the blog running, keep the blog running, keep the blog running. And it was Mm -hmm. like, can we keep it like BuzzFeed? Doesn't really matter. Just research stuff and get it out there. Kevin, can you talk about, uh, you know, SEO and the fundamentals of it and why having a blog on your website is so important? Yeah, I was going to say, and also what are those basics that you mentioned too? Because like... Steven said a lot of people in our space either don't have a site Mm -hmm. 2021 um, or really, really bad content wise, like not just not very much on there. Yeah. I mean, I would say the, the, oh, sorry, I'll answer the basics real quick. I would say the absolute basics are like a pretty clear understanding of what you do um, and like how to get in touch with you. I mean, this like sometimes very difficult to kind of search a site and figure out like, what do I try to do other than having to call, you know, or whatever. So um, I think that's probably the absolute bare bones, like very clear about what you do and uh, like a clear way to, to contact. Um, and then I think, you know, outside of that, it's like actually showcasing work that you've done for other people. Um, you know, maybe even getting a little bit of like how stuff, like how the process works, like that's really awesome. You know, and in your industry could be very clear of like, first we do this, then you get proofs, then the order happens or whatever, like whatever that process is. Um, Helping people understand that up front so that the more questions you're proactively answering in their mind, 
so the, the more momentum they have to to work with you and and uh move forward yeah and that's really like, the key is is um it's just like hyper consistency across some of those key things right like for local businesses especially they're gonna need to have the consistent contact info across so many different um uh, uh, aspects of their website or local pages or anything like that. So like, it's just really ultimately consistency around like who you are and what you do. Um, because that feeds back to how ultimately you get more visibility in search, especially, especially for local businesses. Gotcha. So Kevin, talk about the blog then. Why is the blog one of the most important parts of the site to keep it consistent? It's, I mean, there's a few reasons really. Um, what one is, is ultimately being able to get more, more content and, in, um, indexed in, in search engines, right? The more you're talking about different like concepts and topics that are related to your business, the more opportunity you have to ultimately appear in search for specific things that are relevant to your business. Um, I think for local businesses, again, to kind of point to that is, is just like getting really long tail. So like people who are searching for specific things that might come up in their area around a specific thing that relates to the product and service, like the more you're doing that, the more consistent, consistent you're doing that, consistently you're doing that, the, the better uh, chance you have at, at having a shot at like being on that first page for something at the right time, right? Um, I know I speak about what, it kind of high level, but yeah. What's an example though of, of like long tail in this space? So uh, let's, say, let's say you're in Cincinnati, you're a screen printing shop in Cincinnati. What, what are some long tail keywords that you, sh you should have or be targeting for? It's a great question. I actually, it's, it's funny. There's a bunch of different ways you could likely do that. Um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing, if you're building out local pages that like are really like targeting the products and services, right. So like something that's just pure marketing to Nate's point around like what we do and how we do it. Right. It just depends on the services that you offer. But like, you know, if you're saying it's a, a t-shirt shop and, and you're, you know, printing baseball tees or something, right. Like you could be creating blog content, um, that f highlights some of the work you've done around specific products and services and examples. And you start to generate impressions and clicks potentially off of, off of long tail searches. Like, you know, if it's Cincinnati baseball tee, uh, custom baseball tee printed example t-shirts, like, because they're doing some research around something that they want to get printed, you can start to show up for those like super targeted long tail, uh, terms. So it's like, how do you generate content that like ultimately highlights that? Um, and there's tons of different ways you could do it in a scalable way. So Kevin, what I'm hearing, you kept saying the word local and, and I think we have this big battle in our industry of competing against the beasts, you know, the custom inks of the world that are half billion dollar companies. It's going to be pretty hard to compete with them on a global scale. But what I'm hearing from you is, you know, if you're a small print shop in Cincinnati, producing a lot of content that's Cincinnati based, um, tagging a lot of businesses that are Cincinnati based, writing a lot about of Cincinnati things, that's going to help you kind of monopolize your local economy. Is that what I'm hearing? For sure. For sure. But the one caveat there is like authenticity and resourcefulness, you know, like there's like the two key areas that I'd say you like focus on are those, you know, local pages that potentially tie back to like actual physical locations if you have one or multiple. Um, and then some of that blog content that you can create because um, it's it's ultimately just more opportunities to get indexed. And then at the end of the day, like making sure, again, all that stuff is consistent. Um, in terms of like the, you know, nap data that you have, which is like name, address, phone, um, it's all really like tied to all that page, all those pages in a consistent way. Yeah. And I think for shops listening, when Bruce and Bruce, when you were getting started, you had me generating some of the blogs because I knew industry and I don't know, I didn't know that much then. Uh, but then you also had someone editing it and publishing it. And I think you had a freelancer doing that, right, Bruce? Uh, I am a horrible writer, so I can't focus to to uh, to save my life on writing. And so I realized that it was taking me like eight hours just to write a couple paragraphs. And I was just, I would record a video about a topic, and then I'd give that video to a friend to write about that video and the notes from the video. And then also, yeah, paid you to help me 
write more topics that you were dealing with every day, figuring that was what other people are dealing with every day. So it was like people were Googling for it. Yeah, but I think we only took, they were like half hour topics. Like, could I rant about them for a half hour? Yeah. And then you were just like, keep them raw. We'll edit them. We'll clean them up. I just need your content on there. And I, at the time, I was a little confused as to like why Bruce wants me, who knew nothing about printing, to just consistently write. And now looking back at it, as you guys have curated and gotten better and better, it's evident that now you're the resource for the industry, you know, and now the content is almost like a newsfeed uh, that's really, really strong. And so I think the hardest part for shops is just getting started, you know, like just start yeah. writing. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be dolled up. I guess like to Kevin and Nate, how long does a blog post have to be? What are the key things you have to include when you're writing a blog? Because people could be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> so it's definitely uh, sort of a case by case basis. You know, there's not one rule of thumb for how long a blog post needs to be. Um, there's, I would say typically like probably a minimum of maybe 500 words or so. Like you, you want to have at least enough substance there that, um, that it's it's uh, covering the topic, but um, you know, it really could be anywhere from 500 to 5,000 words. Uh, it just sort of depends on what the topic is you're writing about and, and sort of what it takes to cover it completely. Um, but I think the outside of that, you know, there's certainly the sort of the basics of like the title tag and meta description uh, aligning with that, having a good title for the blog post, um, having good structure with um, using the in your uh, CMS, like the heading tags, like a H2, H3. So it kind of gives some good structure to the post, which for search engines gives sort of context to understand uh, the hierarchy of the, the content. And then for readers, it makes it much easier to skim and sort of uh, move through the, the piece of content there. And then yeah, really just sort of aiming to cover the topic in depth uh, so that when someone lands on that page, they don't have to click back out and go look elsewhere to sort of find the rest of what they were looking for. You know, that's kind of the, the other big piece. And you can get a lot of clues from whatever you're sort of trying to write towards, searching that in, in Google and reading the posts that are on the, the first page there. Uh, you can get a pretty good sense of what those include, how long they are, uh, is a pretty easy way to, to start out there. So, Gotcha. Now, that's big. what would you say are the, you know, websites you shouldn't host on and we're talking like squarespace wix like are there any platforms you shouldn't be on it that are bad for seo and indexing and sites that are user friendly and easy to use for web builders that you would highly recommend yeah i i would say there's not a lot that's like you know completely have to avoid um i think the biggest thing comes down to how much control they give you. So like WordPress, there's a lot of control. There's a lot of plugins for like the Yoast plugin and redirect plugins, a lot of things that uh, can help with the performance of the site and SEO to be able to give you that control. Um, Webflow gives you a lot of control as well. Then you sort of move down the line with like Squarespace, Wix, some of those are, and Wix is I think getting better, but like um, there's just fewer elements that you can control and and customize so i'd say that's probably one of the the biggest factors um and then there, i know there are some softwares out there for like um you know specific industry type of website builders and i'm not as familiar with those but within the sort of the broader scope i think you know if you're listening to this and you're like oh crap my website's on squarespace like i'm doomed i have to move like it's not necessarily the case like you can uh, you can usually make a lot work with what you have uh, before you would need to to read platform. I should mention yeah. Stephen doesn't like WordPress, so oh, it's just yeah. janky for me. But it works. It's the best. <laughs> it's just janky. Um, oh, it, no, it, it, it requires more. Certainly requires yeah. more development work. Like I've yeah. I've often been biased to Squarespace because it's easier to make look better uh, with less yeah. like dev resources. But you do sacrifice some of the the customization, and so now we, we've since moved to Webflow because it's sort of a a little huh. bit better balance Webflow. of like making it look good but also having more control. Um, what interesting. Yeah. interesting. I haven't heard of Webflow. I'm gonna cool. check that one out. Interesting. You know, 
there's like two, it sounds like there's two components though of good SEO. One is the core website, which is the basics. And then one is the blog, which seems like a bonus. That's like, like if you're really on it and you can push more, but just the site, um, you know, if people are looking, I want to revamp the site this year or something like that. What are like the five, three to five things to make sure to have to be localized and optimized for Google to start ranking you higher? So, you know, when people search, you're coming up a bit more in your area. Yeah. Um, a few things really, especially like local. Um, I know I, I've said it probably a couple of times, but the, like hyper authentic and targeted um, local pages. Um, you'll see this a lot, especially with local businesses like th that have multiple locations. Even if it's one location, then that maybe might be your just home page or a specific services page. But making sure that those are really, really like resourceful and again, like featuring like actually like relevant uh, information to the certain area of his areas that you're servicing. There's a lot of businesses that'll generate mm -hmm. these local pages that are like just carbon copies of each other and they just change the location and, and all that. But like, that's, that's kind of like old school and, and it still works to some extent, which is a little unfortunate because I think it, it's building bad habits, but, but really, really authentic pages that are like targeted towards those local, um, things. And then again, that like name, address, phone number, like consistency across those. Um, honestly, uh, the one thing we haven't touched on, which is really big is reviews. Um, if you can start to feature, mm. um, reviews on your website, that's like, that's huge. And, and there's a, a bunch what do you of, you mean like, like people's quotes on there or, or is there like an embeddable Yelp thing that you could put on or? Yeah, there's, there's a few platforms out there that reputation management platforms that'll help you do it. Um, you can do it on your own. There's plugins depending on the website that you're using that can pull in, you know, Google My Business reviews or Yelp reviews or, or whatever. But if you can start to feature that stuff on specific local pages, not only is it like a trust signal to like users, which can increase, you know, your customer acquisition or retention, but it's also pulling in like local, like authentic um, local and organic local um, language, right? People were saying like, I got this for my XYZ graduation party, baseball team, softball, you know, whatever. Um, if you're speaking specifically about the services and it, and it's a really, really can bolster, um, local, local search results. I can't agree more. Um, reviews, reviews, <laughs> this reviews. time, How did you generate a lot of reviews, Steven. I'm, so I'm looking this up. time last year, we got over 300 five star reviews on our Google. Um, no, and, you have, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. There's what, a lot what of are we at? And Yelp. What are we at? I, I don't like Yelp. Uh, Facebook, there's 58. I see Yelp 100 or Google 164. You've got Glassdoor too, which we haven't done that. And I think that's good for hiring, which we had nothing when people are looking oh. for roles. No, you're looking at the tattoo shop. You can check campus ink screen printing, which is a problem. For oh, SEO. you're right. Okay. There's a campus ink tattoo and piercing shop in Madison, Wisconsin. All right, uh, we've been on. dealing with that one for a while, <laughs> but we have more reviews than the tattoo shop. Uh, so this time last year, I was talking to another shop owner, Justin, Oklahoma shirt company. And he asked me, how much would you pay for 500 five-star reviews? And I was like, I don't know. Like, 10 bucks a review. He's like, would you pay 10 bucks a review? You know? And so he led me to employ, like not employ, but actually bring on uh, a review software, which Kevin used to work with for one. Yes. Um, and which one? So um, Kevin, you work review trackers. Okay. So I used something pretty similar. Um, I think I used signpost. Um, and it essentially helps you, you know, get reviews, filter out the bad ones, deal with issues, turn them into loyal customers. And this is over a year. We've gotten 300 five-star reviews just by connecting it to our merch stores. Um, so basically anyone that interacts with Campus Inc. through a merch store via Stripe is going to get this, you know, how likely are you to review Campus Inc.? If you are a four or five, you're going to get a five, you're going to get a review form from Google. Um, and it builds loyalty. And I can't tell you, that was one of the best decisions I've ever made um, early on. Uh, it's something that I never want to get rid of because how badass does it look to my local competition when everyone else has 10 or 15 reviews and I have 315, you know? Yep. Um, and, they're, and they're real reviews. They're not fake. They're 100% real, you know? Yep. Um, yeah, there's... 
there's some really interesting data. Like if you look around, um, because we all have like stats to validate some of this stuff, but there's some really, really interesting um, studies and stuff done around like how if even you increase your average rating from like 3.2 to 4.4 stars, the impact that can have on your conversion rates on your website and and all of this, um, it's it's it, it really is um, a, an incredibly important aspect to like what you're doing for local marketing, and it's only it's only going to continue to be more and more important. So, I'm looking at your site, and maybe you guys can see his site by the way at campus.inc. Maybe we can do a, a quick live evaluation here. And, and if this doesn't yeah. work, that's fine. I'm going to edit it out. But um, it's on a Shopify. We're we're, it, we're having a crisis works, right well, now. I think this could be helpful though. Things that pop up that you guys see, feel free to shout out. Um, but Stephen, real quick, like obviously there's not a ton of localization. Is that be purposeful to go bigger around what I see under solutions? You know, you've got corporate, promotional, chapter, these different high level but long t or, uh, long tail keyword aspects. Um, well, I should bring in Adam for that in the other room, but uh, we are trying to step out of local now. So because we have a national reach, we're on you know, 26 campuses around the country and we've got students everywhere. We're actually trying to sort of not delocalize, but I don't want the world to know we're this print shop in central Illinois anymore, you know. Um, so we're trying to pull that out and make that one segment of the business, but make our, our front page look a little bit more global, I guess. Um, yep. that's the best way yep. to put it. That, um, what do you okay. guys think, Nate and Kevin? Uh, one thing I'll say, which Dear is just worst. kind of, it kind of ties to what we were saying earlier is just authenticity. So like that approach is, is, is strong and it makes sense because if, if you don't have the local presence or a local, um, necessarily brick and mortar place to, to, to tie the reviews to, I mean, you can do it in a way that would make sense. But like, if you're trying to go national, then it makes sense to not necessarily be hyper, hyper targeted. Uh, there's nuance in, yeah. in, in different scenarios to each, but yeah, I know Nate has thoughts on this too, for sure. Yeah. I, I was just going to add, I think that, yeah, I mean, by, if that's your goal, then like it would, it could be less effective if people were arriving from anywhere else and seeing it saying something about, you know, Chicago or whatever, like that's, uh, that's not necessarily what you want it to, to say, you know, like you don't want it to be, um, appearing to only be serving a lo local market and they have to really, cause like people, like one thing that just, you always have to keep in mind is like, people don't read all the content on your website. Like they, they skim and like, you have to understand that they skim for content. And so even if you have it somewhere on your site that like you serve nationwide or something like that, but everything else looks like it's very local and that's not what you're going for, then that's, um, that's not necessarily beneficial. So I think this, this makes a lot of sense, especially when you're yeah serving a lot of campuses and, and corporate clients across the country, stuff like that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So what if, would you guys change? <laughs> yeah. If, if we were employing, <laughs> if, if I called up 10 speed and said, Hey guys, because I get hit up a ton by companies that want to optimize my site. Like people that go find typos on our site and be like, we can find all the typos on your site. If right. you were going through my site at first glance, um, I'll be vulnerable. Tell me exactly how it is. What would you guys say? Does it say? need a full gut? Is it a full gut job that we're looking at? <laughs> no. I, I like, so you said it's on Shopify. I like Shopify. Um, yep. I, I think it takes a, it's just a, sort of a different, um, approach on some of the like product page optimization um you know without looking closely at the blog i think there's probably a, quite a bit of opportunity to since you are sort of moving into more of that national stage to really um find some some topics that have broader appeal but aren't necessarily like the big topics you're going to compete against uh some of the the giants in the industry um and and have some more reach there and then i would say the last piece is probably probably the bigger more meaty one is really um, like you have a lot of products and solutions and uh, all those pages and really kind of like evaluating the way the site's structured, the way you have like, I mean, they're collect called a collections in Shopify, but like, you know, sort of product categories and like the way all that navigation works and everything, um, both from like a user experience standpoint and how people find products and, and work with you, but also how search engines crawl your site and, and index and give uh, waiting to the pages. So I would say that's probably the, the three big things there is like the product page 
optimization, blog topics, and then the sort of the site structure and, and categorization. Sweet. I'll let them yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, what, what, like, what, what should it be though? Is, is it just the way the HTML is structured, for example, for the product pages, or, or is it the content on an example product page? Like, I'm looking at this um, custom all over print ugly holiday sweater. It's got the description of the product, you know, some of the details of what it's made of. Um, it's got images on it. Is there something that you feel like you would want to add in that may be missing? Um, um, I'm not sure. I'm you not. Know, or what do you think? Yeah, I'm not on that one. I'm on the uh, custom. Here, I'm going to share my screen. Basketball jersey. So you can see this one. Um, which now I kind of want one, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So, th so that's good. The one I was on that was like the 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 sublimated uh, basketball jersey. That one had like it didn't have the description, so it was a pretty pretty blank page. So I think this is good. There's probably um, there's typically like you know sort of the description which is a little bit more marketing copy uh and then the like product details yeah so that's a that's an example of, like um so here you would kind of want the description of like the it's a little more fun and whatnot but has still like value you know like uh you sure. know, gear up your team for you know with custom jerseys this season to stand out from the rest or whatever like those types of copy to kind of like hit that first paragraph and then go into like all the details on the product specs uh and then you could have opportunities to have you know specific product reviews on these pages um and maybe gotcha. sizing charts would be the other area that you would yeah include. something that's... we had we had to hire for is to remove because we don't really use this site for actual like e-commerce yeah um but actually just lead forms like getting a quote, um, speed to quote is huge for us. And just like the lead form is very big because we use reps. Um, and so that's cool. like, we're struggling right now with that because we're using a job form and you'll see it's a little bit slow. Yeah. Um, and so we're gonna, we have to revamp that right now to figure out um, just like, you know, when someone gets to your site, how quickly do you get in touch with them? Um, or like, how long are they staying on your site? What do y'all think about using like sites like Lucky Orange to watch like traffic on your site, heat maps, where people start and stop? Do you guys recommend things like that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, I think I would go into it with a clear question that you want answered. Um, anyone can turn it on and see all these you know green and orange splotches and you don't necessarily know what you want to do with it. But if you want to look at it and be like, are people actually clicking on the get a quote button on a product page or are they, you know, doing something else going up to the top nav or whatever, like having specific question that you want to answer with the data, I think is a, is a great way to approach it. And that is super valuable because it's something that even looking at analytics data or whatever, it just won't, it won't tell you. And sometimes it's shocking the, insights that can come from that and the, the level of improvement you can get on the site. Gotcha. So let me ask this, because a lot of shops have social, meaning like Facebook is there, Instagram is there, maybe not Twitter, maybe not Pinterest. What are the fundamental, you know, a shop might say, well, I, I'm very present on my social media. What are the fundamental differences between running a great blog and having a great website and running social? Because I think they're slightly different. I think again, like I'm gonna sound like a broken record. I mean, with with social, it's consistency. Um, so I think there's a lot of similarities to how everything should be run, and there should be some like cohesion between each of what 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 you're doing there. I think with social in this space, it's really interesting because um, there's such a big opportunity to um, to call uh, like customers to action, basically to post and and feature products and and everything on on social, and that just creates this like almost like pretty not um automatic but a really scalable and, and maybe easier way to kind of like keep pushing messaging out and and growing it um growing your audience because you can get people to do the work a little bit for you and you're just kind of trying to push that message back out um so i mean like it's a little bit of a different motion in terms of like the content that you're trying to feature but i think like that's really like i where the big opportunity on social i think for for uh for shops and online shops, print shops, all that stuff is just like user generated content. Um, and I do think is that there you, an, is yeah. there an, 
sorry, is there an SEO advantage though for social or is it just a social proof thing like you're saying of, of people seeing what you're doing and them reaching yeah. out? Uh, I mean, it, more of a social proof thing in, to, to my knowledge. Um, I don't, there's no real signals. There's been studies I think done over years around, you know, what, what social, what social media is doing for, for local, or I'm sorry, for or, organic SEO efforts. Um, and I, I think that that's, there's a lot to be probably done there. And, but ultimately it's not really doing anything outside of, again, like the, the local, um, social stuff, like, you know, Google my business and all that. Um, uh, I think back in the day there was, and I'll end it really quickly with like Google when they dipped their toes into having a social network with, um, Google plus Google plus Google plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, I think like the one time where it maybe had an impact. Um, but no, unfortunately not. It's a different play. Yeah. So, so yeah, in I layman's think- terms, it does not really affect having a, a great social media. It doesn't really touch your blog. doesn't help index doesn't really help your search. Now on the Facebook front or the Instagram front, yeah, if you're interacting with community pages and community people, it's great, but they're kind of separate more or less. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yep, I would say they're they're pretty separate. The way you combine them the most, because uh, really uh, when you're creating blog content, it's, it's probably doing one of two things. It's like a way to showcase, sort of like, um, you know, if you just wanted to, write a blog post on how you help sports teams. And again, going back to Cincinnati or whatever, like sports teams, sports leagues in Cincinnati. And you had like a bunch of sections in this one blog post highlighting, uh, you know, the youth soccer league and then this, and, and you know, kind of like spelling it all out, sort of like a showcase or you're creating content targeted at keywords. And that's what we were talking about before. That's like, we specifically want to rank for these keywords to bring in traffic from search. Social is definitely that's building the audience, it's building community, engaging. Um, and I would say where you are able to sort of overlap those is when you're taking some of the content in the blog uh, blog post you're writing and sharing it on social, um, just to kind of like, if you have you know a longer blog post, take part of it, turn it into a social post. Um, but then also as you're sharing blog content on social, you have more just like you would send it out in a newsletter or something like that. Like you have an audience, captive audience to come, you know, potentially read that content, share it, like it, like um, link to it, perhaps like do things that might uh, create some real signals that would benefit SEO. So um, from kind of what you're saying is it's not necessarily more, but sometimes it's about repurposing. Mm -hmm. And I think Bruce Luke on your team does this really, really well, where we'll record a podcast or a video then he'll write a blog about it, have a couple Facebook posts, Instagram posts, um, even like send out an email with it. And you've taken one little piece and you've spread um, the depth of it kind of using the width of the football field, which is kind of cool. So I think it's not necessarily you can take one piece on how to print a shirt and you can go left, right, up, down with it uh, and, and, and it'll reach a lot farther. So I think that's really interesting. Now, is there, you know, if shops are not using email marketing or reviews or blog, what do you think is the most important? Because I know we haven't really touched on email marketing, but is that a big part of what you all do? We don't do email marketing specifically, um, but I, I mean, it is a, a very powerful tool. Like I'm, I'm definitely a, a big believer in uh, building your own sort of owned audience. I don't wanna say owned, because like, you know, uh, but you like you have sort of your own list that you can market to and, and have control over. You're not having to uh, rely on you know Facebook or Google or something. And so, um, yeah, I think even as simple as just having a sort of newsletter capture um, on your site to be able to to have people sign up for the newsletter and be building that audience and sending out valuable content, not just constant you know store promotions or um, you know sales and stuff like that. So. Um, the more you can kind of understand your audience and and send stuff that's valuable and, and beneficial um, is is great and and building that and then um, and then using yeah email as a, a good channel for um, staying in front of people and and uh, continue to drive business. It feels like a really good starting point is an intern for the summer that enjoys writing though, because you know. I worry people are like, well, how do, how do I even start? Like, I don't have time. Nobody here has time to be able to do this. Um, 
but but somebody just writing it like maybe you 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 writing down the top 10 sort of these long tail keywords that you're trying to target that people are searching for about or or can relate to your business and then having somebody just go through and knock those off which could be i don't know an intern home english major or something like the journalism major somebody that's uh at school and home for the summer that can be able to tackle these and knock them out at least just to start i'm sure they're not going to be super seo to the to the tens but can get something out since most people just have nothing yeah yeah i mean that's that's what we do it it, we bring in interns over the summer we try to generate as much content that's going to last 26 weeks until winter break um and if it's one piece a week that's 26 different pieces we need to come up with you know um it's 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 hard to validate as a as a small print shop to have a full-time you know, a lot of these shops don't have full-time marketing people or full-time SEO or full-time bloggers, but you can yep. piece it together. You definitely can. Yep. yep. And like freelancers is another option. If you like, uh, you know, if even just going through the process of hiring an intern and whatever is just too, too cumbersome, too time consuming, like freelancers can, can do that. And that's like, we work with a lot of clients where we're doing all the strategy planning, all of that work. And then they have freelancers that we hand over the the details of here's what to write about, here's how to structure it, and then the freelancer takes it and writes it. Um, and that's a, a pretty easy way to, once you get rolling, you know, be pretty hands-off, uh, but know that you're kind of making progress and, and building some of that stuff out. But yeah, totally agree. Interns, uh, freelancers, it doesn't have to be a shop owner yeah. sitting down and writing like their, their greatest work. Uh, so... Kind of a wrap up question, but how do y'all measure the success of SEO? Is it a sales thing? Are you able to attribute like success to it? Because it is kind of a generic, to me, it feels a little bit broad and you've got to do a lot of things consistently for a long time. How do you create those attributions for your clients? We, um, we look at a couple different levels. There's, um, I'd say the, the broadest and most vague is sort of what we talked about where you're creating content that you can then use so there's like it's not just a blog post that sits there and does its thing like you can take that repurpose it turn it into social content turn it into email content um so it is uh time you're spending on a blog post but then is is helping fuel other marketing channels um and then from there i'd say sort of like your traditional seo metrics of sort of understanding search impressions clicks, you know, the, the traffic you're getting from, from Google and the other search engines. Um, the number of keywords that you're ranking for um, is another big one. And then we do work with clients to kind of understand like what are your conversion points. So in your case, um, that might be the, the lead form submissions or uh, if it's a store purchase or whatever that might be. Um, that's, you know, we want to understand which blog posts are bringing people in and they're converting by filling out that form or or taking the action Uh, as well as we look at assisted conversions, which is a cool metric that kind of shows blog content is often sort of the first way that people find you or, or or get introduced to your, your company. And so um, seeing people that came from a blog post at some point in their journey, but then later converted through, you know, a PPC ad or came directly back to your site. Uh, the assisted conversion kind of helps give a, a broader picture of the blog is having this amount of impact on bringing people in that did ultimately convert. Uh, and then yes, when we can, uh, when when companies have the data available, like understanding real revenue dollars is is the sort of the ultimate goal because like traffic doesn't pay the bills, you know. So like uh, it's really about what's what's it resulting in from a business standpoint directly and in the assisted conversion viewpoint so yep so kind of yeah three different layers of like it's helping your marketing and then like the seo metrics and sort of the conversion and and business metrics this is such a long process too i i I feel like uh it's sort of like you know when you see people say i tried facebook ads it didn't work you know but it's they just ran an ad for two weeks didn't try any other creative and then yep. called it quits. 
Whereas it seems like this is, you know, you're lo- this is either a core piece of your business or it isn't. And you're just doing it like you do, you know, outbound sales or something or you're not. Um, yep. and, it, and I feel like if shops just aren't going to commit to it, then, OK, just don't commit to it. But it feels like it just snowballs. I mean, it for sure has for us. And, and, and I feel like we have a ways to go still. But, um, yeah, yeah, it feels like that's more of the way to think about it versus the like this is a campaign for a month yeah and that's it's something that we we really want to talk through with people before we work with them and you can typically tell that there's a difference between like yeah we're thinking about trying this versus like this is a core priority for our business either like we have we already have this channel and we need to make it better or like we know we want content to be a big part of our marketing strategy like we're already bought in we're committed to it we 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 have like a multi-year view on this um and i I think you're right i think it does it does make a big difference um in in kind of how you're approaching it and how committed you are really on the the outset heck yeah awesome guys this has been really cool uh if you guys have questions about seo or want your own website review now that steven's an expert he can jump into the comments (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, but but I actually I love giving feedback in that so so drop them into the comments on this video um, and we love to be able to help you guys out this is Nate Turner and Kevin King out of 10 speed you guys can reach out to them if you want to work with them directly they have really cool programs that can take a ton of work off of your plate too and just write for you which is huge because nobody has time ain't nobody got time for that but you guys can reach out to them they're 10 speed T-E-N speed.io. And we'll drop a link down in the description below so you guys can reach out and chat with them too. Thanks, Kevin and Nate. Appreciate you guys joining us. We'll see you guys on the next episode on next Thursday. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.